Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 390 of the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better the experts in functional training and rehabilitation. I'm your host, Anthony Rana. The show notes are located at strengthcoachpodcast.com. All right, today on the strengthcoach.com and mbsc.tv Coaches Corner, spoke to Coach Boyle about why he finds himself apologizing to his staff often. Uh, We're going to talk about similarities in fundamental patterns across sports. Obviously, a big part of that is the long-term athletic development idea and having kids play a bunch of sports and how important it is to see those similarities. And we're going to kind of touch on the machine debate when they're appropriate. Normally, maximizing the member experience segment with Simit Seth. Simit's going to talk about a simple shift in language that can make all the difference in how your members feel about their experience even when things go wrong. And we're going to finish our four-part series with Allie Gilbert uh, on testosterone replacement myths and misconceptions. Allie is doing the Silverback Summit this week. I'm going. It's November 15th and 16th. It's not too late. Uh, it's going to be in Phoenix. You can get $200 off by using the code AllieG200. Really looking forward to this, guys. You can check it all out at SilverbackSummit.com. She's going to talk today in part four about hair loss and fertility, two big questions that men often have when they're thinking about going on testosterone. All right, Perform Better's signature series line is changing the game when it comes to weight training. The series rack, the signature series racks are fully customizable. They allow you to create the most efficient and effective rack system to fit your space and weightlifting program. With cable column options now, your training opportunities are practically endless. They also have the signature series plate loaded line, which will give you a sleek look while providing an easy and simple way to train. You can check it all out at performbetter.com. Lots of things to get to. So let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, guys, now it's time for the shrinkcoach.com and nbsc.tv Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. You can try both shrinkcoach.com and Body by Boyle, or I should say, um, it's not Body by Boyle online anymore, mbsc.tv. <laughs> uh, and you can try both for free, seven days. Uh, you can go to those respective websites, mbsc.tv and shrinkcoach.com for your seven-day free trial. Coach, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Ann. How are you? All right, all right. Coach, you know what? I it's funny. I I always check Twitter and everything and and uh sometimes I forget this because when you're not saying it as much, I always mean to ask you, what are you reading right now? Well, I'm actually reading um spy novels right now, truthfully. <laughs> okay. You need that sometimes. Uh, yep, I do that. Every once in a while I just sort of get out of the uh professional book world and just start reading for pleasure again. And lately I've been reading for pleasure. I'm reading, uh, I forget the title, but it's, um, it's the second in the terminal list series. I don't know if you saw the terminal list. It was on, I think Amazon prime. It's, you know, it's about a ex Navy seal who gets sold out by his, uh, by the government and then goes on a, like a revenge spree. And it's actually a whole series of books and it might've been, uh, Andy McCloy actually had recommended another series to me and I read all those. And then I was looking for something similar and somebody had said, you should look at the terminal list series. And I actually liked the terminal list when I watched it on, uh, I think it was prime. And so I started reading that. I actually was just thinking today that I need to order another one. Cause I'm almost done. Yeah. I got to do it every once in a while too. Like, although right now I'm, I'm listening to uh, good energy by Casey means I went on a huge run of the 1980 Olympic hockey team books, right? Um, and, and you know, series and Netflix and, you know, whatever, documentaries, because I just kind of uh, was kind of really into it. So, uh, but I needed it. And now I'm back to kind of the industry stuff. Yeah, I, it's funny. I, I actually, well, I should, um, I lied, actually. So I just started skimming this last night. I'll give Missy Macbeth her plug here. Uh, but uh, developmental to Division One. 
which is uh, she did a pretty nice job, truthfully, not to just plug her book, but she kind of did what I did. You know, when I did functional training for sports, they said um, we want something that can be read by a coach, a kid, a parent, a therapist. And I think she did a good job with that in terms of looking at this and saying, hey, if you're a strength coach, you'll like the book. If you're a volleyball coach, you'll like the book. If you're a parent of a volleyball kid, you like the book. And I think she hit the mark pretty good. So I was kind of skimming through that yesterday as I look at what's sitting beside me. Yeah, I saw I saw the tweet and it made me think about it. And I think when you do that, sometimes when you write it for other people, sometimes it gives the strength coach ideas about how to approach parents or how to talk to parents. So you should have her on so she can. Yeah, I'm going to contact her. Yeah, because the one thing I like about her is she writes like she talks and she's got a little kind of snarky, sarcastic side to her that comes through in the book, which I like. So East Coast girl? No, actually, I believe wow. she's, I think she's from Texas. I'm not sure. I know she's not. Right. Interestingly enough, Zach DeCant wrote the forward for her book, and she started, I believe, at TCU as a GA at around the same time that Zach started. So cool. I always cool. felt like someone was asking me the other day about basic strength and conditioning books to read, and I need to make another list because – when I think about, um, you know, Kurt Hester's Ransom for Strength and Conditioning Madman, and I think about Moving Over Maxes, there's some books that I think when I look at my old list, my old list is old. Yeah. So I need a new list. I'm actually going to, I always, you inspire me, Anthony, just so you know, I'm always thinking when I'm talking to you. And uh, <laughs> so now I'm making my new book list. All right. I'm good for something. Um, Mike, I like. <laughs> I, it's a really interesting tweet. I find myself apologizing to our staff because I want us to be better. They're amazing and do an amazing job, but I always want to be better. And I think it's a really important reminder for gym owners because if we don't remind ourselves that maybe, you know, sometimes, because like one thing in business and business coaches will always tell you this, you're not going to find staff like you. It's, gonna, it's, it's very hard to find staff like you that thinks like you, that acts like owners, unless you're actually giving them some kind of ownership responsibility. And it's really hard. And, you know, so you were a workaholic and, you know, you have your, your have a growth mindset. You're always reading. You were going to conferences. You're talking to other coaches and not everybody's going to be like that. And I think it's important for uh, business owners to understand that you got to take a step back once in a while. Remember that your staff isn't you and that they're trying, oh, but at the same time, you want to be better. Just kind of talk about why, you, what made you tweet this. Well, I was thinking uh, just about staff meetings and how often in staff meetings, I apologize because I always, because, okay, I'm going to go on a rant again about things that we need to do better. And then I have to be, I want you guys to understand that I love you, that I think you're wonderful, that you're doing an amazing job, but, there's areas that we need to get better in. And I struggle with it sometimes because I, I don't want them to feel like I'm negative. I don't want them to feel like I don't think they're doing a great job. I don't want them to feel like I don't like them. Yet at the same time, I have to get across the areas where we need to improve. And and it's like you said, you, you realize that, I mean, you're always on them about attention to detail and about cleaning up and about it. I, I made the salt shaker reference in there, which actually, I think, I think the Danny Meyer thing originally came from you, if I'm not mistaken, but I think you were the one who had said that, but um, I talked to, to Steve and Kevin and Dan and Vinny and stuff at work about that. You know, I gave them all that book and I always say to them, you've got to be moving the salt shaker every day. You got to be, you got to be getting it back in the middle of the table, knowing that, there's somebody else out there working who maybe doesn't really care if it's in the middle of the table, if it kind of is on the edge, they're like, eh, whatever, you know, someone else will come and move it back. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're not a great coach. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're not great with kids. It doesn't necessarily mean they're not great with our adults. So yeah, I guess that's my, and what I've been, what I always do Twitter to me is sort of, you remember the old, uh, this is your brain on drugs commercial. I feel like that yeah. sometimes like this is my brain on drugs. This is just my, my stream of consciousness life, like if I think of something, I just sort of type it in and throw it out there with very little regard for one, whether anyone's going to give a shit in terms of I might get two likes. Sometimes I'll put something out that I think is really insightful and realize, wow, I got very, very little uh, interaction with that. And then other times I'll put something up 
that I don't think is going to generate any interaction at all. And it gets 300 likes. So it's, I guess I, I don't play, although people always accuse me of playing for likes. I don't play for likes. I'm just, I really believe that Twitter X, whatever is a really good educational platform and that you can really encourage people to think on there. So I just kind of keep pitching stuff out. Yeah. I think with you, uh, it wouldn't be the same for me, but I think with you, you kind of, I don't want to say have a responsibility, but you have a lot of followers who are looking to you for guidance. And sometimes when you're throwing that stuff out there, they're going to get a better idea than of, of who you are as a person as well. Cause you don't, you don't just post about those things. You also, you know, family stuff sometimes and whatever, but they, you almost have like a responsibility, like what's going on in Mike's head right now? Because, you know, that, it's really a good way uh, besides the people that really you know, were on shrinkwits.com and the forum was really, you know, a place where, you know, people can get your true thoughts and like extended thoughts and repeated thoughts because you're always going to respond even, you know, if not once or twice, maybe three or four times. But I think there is an element of that where it's people, you know, even like today you posted about, you reposted Jeremy Frisch's, um, there was a diagram relationship between fundamental motor skills and specific sports skills. And it was an overall arm throw and it showed softball, cricket, volleyball, badminton, netball, baseball, javelin, and tennis all at the top. So the arms at the top, like kind of throwing in that throwing position. It was like, look, you don't they, they, look how similar these are. They're all different sports. You can have people playing. You're a big thing. So sometimes you need to say it in a different way. This was a great way to say, Hey, look, there's so many movement patterns that are similar and throughout these diverse sports, you don't need to do the same sport. I think you can throw like golf, hockey, baseball in there together too, with the rotational aspect, even some of these oh, sports as well. I say that all the time, you know, field hockey, there's so many, I say to people, just figure out what the kid does and then show them what that medicine ball throw looks like in their, you know, again, we talk about right in their lens. Maybe it's, maybe I'm lower because it's a drive in field hockey. Maybe I'm you know, getting a little more backswing because it's golf, maybe whatever. But yeah, you're you're a hundred percent right. And I think you're right. The biggest thing is the responsibility part. Sometimes I'll people will get mad at me. I've actually had someone come back at me on Twitter, private message me and say that they think I'm a bully. And you're a bully on Twitter. And and I say, no, I'm not a bully on Twitter, but I feel the need to say if I don't agree with a tweet. Because People are getting their information right now in strength and conditioning and fitness from places like Twitter and Instagram. So if you let something go by without commenting on it, you are basically agreeing with it. And so I try, and I don't always, but I try sometimes, I'll, and I even try to say it politely, well, I don't necessarily agree with that. And I did that the other uh, couple weeks ago at the box squad thing. I can't stand it. When, when I see these young kids box squatting, it makes me freaking crazy because I know that it's going to bite them in the ass 10, 20 years down the road. Their back is going to, they're going to have an issue and I'm going to feel like, wow, you know, that was some knucklehead putting 500 pounds in their back and telling them to sit on the box and then drive there, you know, drive off. And I did a, uh, a Zoom call with University of Minnesota football strength coach the other day with Todd Wright. And we were talking about that because that was one of the questions or something that that you think you should never do. And I said, box squat. And it, 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 it that one really burns people's ass because it's sort of the anti Louis Simmons thing. And people say, I can't believe that, you know, that you're questioning West Side Barbell. And I'm just like one. The whole West Side Barbell name was co-opted from West Side Barbell in California from 20 years before. So let's just dispense with, you know, again, I it's. I don't love the powerlifting mentality as it applies to sports training anyway. And I, of all the things I dislike about that, the one I dislike the most is box squat. So yeah, I think you've got to be willing to, to have an opinion. If you don't have an opinion, as you said, people that are looking at me maybe as a, whatever, as a thought leader, I guess, which maybe is giving myself too much credit. But when people I know are looking at me in that regard, then I have to give responses that are accurate and sometimes they're going to be unpopular and you have to do it too because i think and kind of like segueing into the next topic i was wanted to talk about machine 
training. So let's say a chest press on a, on a machine or a fly or rowing on a machine. Um, one of the things is, I think when you talk about these things from your lens and you're, you're talking about, you know, that responsibility, say, Hey, look, this is from my lens. Cause right now there is a movement towards longevity and health span, right? Peter Ritchie has been one of the big guys in, in that movement. And one of the things they keep talking about is, you know, having muscle. Now, there's no studies right now based on whether or not a lunge is better. Like, if you can build muscle in your legs either way. Now, you and I are going to argue, hey, look, I still think a lunge is better because it's single leg. I think even if you did a single leg leg extension, I still think a lunge is better. You're standing up. There's so much more going on, and it replicates what we're doing in real life. But the argument would be from that lens, hey, if I build muscle, the studies are that longevity is tied to, there's a lot of, um, uh, mu- the more muscle you have, you're more likely to live longer. Maybe you're not going to get hurt from a fall as much, or you'll recover better, et cetera. So I think there is that piece of it too, because I, you, you know, would you feel like you would change your mind a little bit on, hey, if we look at the longevity conversation, would that workout at crunch, let's say that circuit of machines, would that be okay for somebody who's in their 50s or 60s and hasn't worked out in a while and they're trying to build some muscle? Way to bait me in. You're unbelievable. I love it. <laughs> no, because I would look at it and think, again, what is our number one cause of disability in elderly? Falling. Right. So off, right off the bat, you, you've already made my case for me. So I and again, I get into so. So there's that aspect of it. There's and I think, again, neural, if we look, we can say correlation versus causation. Right. With they're correlating muscle to, to whatever living longer or muscle to living better or whatever it is. But I think there really is probably some relationship to how you obtained that muscle. And so I think just muscle for muscle's sake maybe isn't nearly as good as muscle that is well developed neurally to be able to handle the demands. I'm I'm actually doing and I said so I'm gonna rewrite functional training for sports. I'm gonna do a third edition. They asked me to do it and I'm gonna do it. Really? Yes. Because enough has changed, I think, since 2016. It's been eight more years. Wow. Enough has changed. I know it's really hard. I couldn't believe it was eight years either. But when they asked me about it, I thought, wow, there are a lot of things that I'd probably do differently if I did that book over again. And, um, and I'm doing functional strength coach eight. And one of the things I'm doing in functional strength coach eight is getting, is kind of wading into the functional training argument again. And there's a couple of really good videos that I have. One was a Nicole Delagos years ago, did one of like a baby workout. I don't know if you remember, but I remember that everything with a baby and that's real life. And then there's another one. I don't even know where it came from. I think I got it off the internet, but it was a stewardess and they were showing different exercises in like you know, pushing the cart down the aisle versus pushing a sled and, you know, lifting bags up into an overhead compartment versus, you know, doing some sort of overhead lifting pattern. And I think we can try to be simplistic about it and say that machines are fine. And again, in the, the, the something, I apologize, Clark, be quiet. My dog is barking in the something is better than nothing category. I agree. If someone said to me, either this person is going to do the 12 circuits of, you know, 12 station circuit of machines that, you know, at crunch or at curves or something like that, or isn't going to do any strength training, I'd say absolutely do the machines. But again, when someone's asking me in some sort of public forum like this or Twitter or wherever it is, I think I would much rather see somebody again. I, we were talking about on strength coach, um, Steve Eshan was asking about He's got a lot of coaches teaching bench press in the uh, in the weight room right now, like sport coaches, you know, trying, oh, you got to arch your back. You know, you got to do this, you got to do that. And he said, you know, do we really want that powerlifting influence? And my thing was, I'm not going to die on the bench press hill. But if someone said to me, what's the best exercise? I'd probably say for an adult standing cable press is going to be better. And, you know, I love those uh, those AT 400 standing cable press little units that you can hook up to your uh to your weight stacks because again now if i look at that is it more functional yes am i getting anterior core strength yes am i getting balanced yes am i in standing yes there's all these things that are going to be way more positive so i think 
I, I can't sit there and I get it because I mean, I know for a fact, I loved like, I used to love some of the seated row machines and bent over row machines. And there was some, there was some particularly, I don't know why, but pulling always seemed to be something that you could do better with machines. And then you get into the fact of, all right, but do I have, again, and I said, if I had unlimited weight room space, unlimited, someone said, Hey, you can have a hundred thousand square foot facility. You know what I mean? There's a shopping mall going out. They're going to give you the whole thing. Okay. I might have a couple of different belt squats. There might be things or I might have a pendulum squat. There might be a whole bunch of things that I'd put in there. I might have a bunch of different row variation machines that are in there. So I might have a little machine section, but I know I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't have a curl machine. I wouldn't have a tricep machine. I would never have a leg extension. I would never have a leg curl. I probably wouldn't have a leg press really, but at the same time, I might include some of those other machines. But then when I look at business, because we were talking about this the other day and someone said, uh, buying, I told you I bought that ISO fit isometric uh, rack and I didn't buy more because they, the staff didn't love the idea, which is fine. I'm going to use it more myself during the summer or, you know, in, in the off season, I'll, I'll use it with my athletes and I'll figure out a way to use it with a group. But what you realize is you have to have a bunch of anything. If you're going to use them in a business, you have to have a, you have to have equipment that's commensurate with how you're going to run your program. So you might say, Oh, I love, uh, I love those when I can't even think what it's called anymore, but it was sort of like a chest supported row where you were kind of laying on it and it was kind of like a T bar row sort of set up, but your chest. Yes. Was I love that machine. But do I want four of those machines in my weight room? No, I can't. I love the belt squat. Do I want four belt squats in my weight room? No, even that's what I say to people like, I love the K box idea, but I'm not putting eight K boxes in. I'm not spending that amount of money to do that. We, we got some wheeler eccentric pulleys that we're using for some stuff, but even that, I, you know, I haven't, I haven't quite been able to, to get what I want to get even out of that in terms of the lower body setups that I'd like to get. So I just think it's in some ways it's a really simple yes, no. And then in other ways, it's probably a really complicated, Oh, it depends, but yeah, I'll go with the, simple, think, I'll go with the simple no. And I think it's a, I think it's a lens thing and it's also a progression thing. So if you have somebody who's new, yeah, great. And then you could start to mix certain things in as they move forward. But I think the ultimate goal for me personally is that they're going to be standing up most of the time right. with and the imagine, cable machines. Right. But doing, you know, like you, where you're working now and you're in a big box gym, you can play with stuff if you got one-on-one -on -one clients. I think yeah. I'd work with a lot more machines. If I was doing one-to-one -one training in a big box gym, I'd probably play with more machines, obviously, than than I do in our setting because our setting is not conducive to really having. Yeah. You have again, I say to somebody, we got basically we've got some anchor pulleys, we've got some Kaiser uh, functional trainers, we've got a few Kaiser um, uh, cable columns. That's it. There's not much else in there that yeah. that falls under the the realm of machine. Yeah. And also I have a, I have a group of three that I work with three times a week and it's very hard programming wise. I'm like, guys, sometimes we can't do certain things because, you know, you got Johnny doing, you know, his, his little shoulder exercise that he's doing wrong on the cable machine and other guys doing curls or triceps, like go somewhere else, go on the tricep machine and do yeah. that. But yeah, that problem all the time, even at our place with personal training clients in terms of I'll walk in with my personal training clients sometimes and look around and think like, okay, what's, who's got, who else has personal training clients in here right now? What, you know, what exercises are the adult clients using? And then look and think, okay, this is what the program is going to be today because this is what's readily available. Okay. A lot of times I always think I like a double arm standing press one day, like a single arm standing press another day. And Maybe I, you know, maybe another day I let them do dumbbell bench press because they like it more than I like it. But I got to figure out, well, if the bench is near the dumbbell racks are being used, then it's standing cable press day. And we got to go over. We've got kind of three almost dedicated personal training stations off to the left now because we were having such a hard time integrating everything in there at the same time, which is a great problem to have. Yeah, Absolutely. Coach, before I leave, I want to say happy birthday because we won't be, you know, next time we're talking to you is about a week or two weeks away. So uh, Halloween is uh, 60, 65. 65. 65. You can retire. 
<laughs> I can retire. I can retire. I can. I have to register for whatever it is, Medicaid or Medicare or whatever that is. And yeah. in the in the fine history of our government, they make you do it. They don't ask you if you want it. They tell you that you have to do it, which I think is one yeah. of the things in history. But you got to start taking out some money too, right? Is it, seriously, I'm serious. I don't right? know. If I don't have to actually. I think I can wait a couple more years before I have to start taking some money out, which is good. Okay. Cool. Start, it's funny how suddenly you're at a point where. They're saying, no, okay, you've saved for time and you got to start taking some of it out. And you got to start taking our insurance versus the insurance that work pays for. I think actually, though, I started thinking about it. I have to figure out if I actually can save MBSC money when I switch over. Because, But I don't know how it works with that guy. I still have a family. I still have kids that are, Michaela and yeah. are still on my insurance. So I don't even know how I, all that works either. So uh, I have a little bit of figuring to do. There you go. All right, Coach, thanks for doing this, and we'll talk to you next time. All right, thanks, Ant. I appreciate it. Hey, guys, it's Allie Gilbert, the Queen of Men's Health, and we are back for our final series in this series. Final series in the series. Sounds great. (laughs) So part four is going to be hair loss and fertility with testosterone. These are two things that many men get very confused about and often struggle with because they think that testosterone is going to make them infertile and lose their hair. So first off, we're going to tackle hair loss. If you have a genetic predisposition to losing your hair, testosterone might accelerate that process a little bit, but it's not guaranteed. And a lot of guys struggle with this, and we often have to counsel them through if they do start to lose their hair. A lot of people want to take hair loss medications, something like uh, Propecia, which is finasteride or dutasteride or something of the like. And honestly, those medications are detrimental to men's health. And the reason being that it blocks the conversion to a strong form of testosterone that basically is reducing your ability to operate fully as a man. But not only that, it can actually cause some erectile dysfunction issues, some bladder issues. It's just not something looked upon favorably for guys. So It's really coming to terms with, are you going to sacrifice the quality of your health to save a certain haircut, or can you look good with a shaved head? There are options for hair transplants. There are somewhat safer things like topical minoxidil, but ultimately you do want to stay away from hair loss medications because they can be very harmful for guys. So again, going on TRT does not guarantee you're going to lose your hair. If you have a genetic predisposition, you might, but it's not a surefire way to have hair loss. So hopefully that clarifies some things. And then moving on to fertility. So when you take testosterone exogenously, your body says, oh, cool, I'm getting this hormone from an outside source. I don't need to necessarily make it myself. So the production in the testicles actually slows down and or stops. So this can have a suppressive effect on sperm production, and it might compromise things a little bit, but it does not mean all of a sudden you're using birth control for guys. If it was a contraceptive for men, then it would be utilized as a contraceptive for guys. But there are actually bodybuilders who take massive doses of testosterone among other anabolics, and they're still able to conceive. So the way this works is if you do want to have children one day, but you also very much need testosterone, consider the fact that you do want to go into fatherhood as an optimal man. So the right steps would be to get a sperm test before onset of TRT just to see where you are. Because if you go on TRT without getting one and then you do a sperm test, 
if you do have suppressed sperm production, automatically anybody's going to really blame TRT. So it's important to know where you stand beforehand. And then when you go on testosterone, you can do more sperm tests just to see how your production's flowing. And then when you are ready to conceive, say four to six months out, there are medications that you can bring in to bring sperm production up. Those are HCG, which is human chorionic gonadotropin, which is the female pregnancy hormone. And that can help re-stimulate sperm production as well as bioidentical FSH. Men have LH, which is luteinizing hormone, and FSH, which is follicle-stimulating hormone. FSH directly will help the production of sperm in the testicles. So within four to six months, usually men who go on that are able to conceive quite easily, and then you can come off those medications and stay on testosterone. So a lot of the times we will hear that guys are told they have to come off testosterone completely to be able to reconcile their sperm. And that simply isn't true. And he's not going to feel good. He probably doesn't want to have sex. So it kind of is obsolete and a moot point. And any of our guys who do want to have children, we execute that protocol that I just mentioned. But also it's just the education process of understanding that if even if you're young, if you're in your 20s and you are hypogonadal and you cannot function as a guy, you literally have just such poor energy, drive, motivation, vitality, all this stuff, and you need testosterone, that's what you should be going on. Some clinics will offer enclomiphene as an alternative so that it does not suppress sperm production. And clomiphene is very harmful for guys because it does bring on ocular side effects. It can cause non-alcoholic fatty liver. It may make your labs look pretty and bump your test levels up, but it does not always resolve the symptoms. Actually, rarely does it resolve any symptoms. It's more like a placebo effect. Um, and then some clinics will offer monotherapy with HCG. Same thing, not all guys do very well on it. It's not testosterone. So it's kind of like if a diabetic absolutely needs insulin, you're not going to give them protein to go through this complicated process to try to produce insulin. If you need testosterone, testosterone is going to be the best option for you. So a lot of these topics get discussed at length at the Silverback Summit. And that's why I want you guys to consider coming because you will get the truth as to what precautions you have to take with testosterone, if any, um, what the proper paths are at onset of testosterone to maintain fertility, to be able to make sure that you are the healthiest version of yourself possible, as well as learning everything fitness, nutrition, and business when it comes to men's health. So I hope you guys can make it November 15 and 16 in Phoenix, Arizona, silverbacksummit.com. Use the code allyg 200 $200 off. I really would love to see you there. Come hang out with Anthony and I. It's going to be such an awesome time. So I hope to see you guys there. Welcome back to Nomly's Maximizing the Member Experience segment with me, Sumit Seth, the co-founder of Nomly where we delve into the strategies and tactics that elevate your business and helps you foster personalized connections at scale so you can create that remarkable community. Today, we're talking about a simple shift in language that can make all the difference in how your members feel about their experience, even when things go wrong. And that is saying thank you. And instead of, I'm sorry, it can actually get you further when something goes wrong. Yep, you heard that right. Picture this. One of your members shows up on time for their session, but their coach is running late. Now, when the coach finally arrives, instead of saying, I'm sorry, I'm late, they say, thank you for your patience. Not only does it keep the mood positive, but it actually leaves the member feeling appreciated rather than just placated. Now, this isn't just about feel-good theory. It's actually backed by research. A study conducted in Chinese-American study held at restaurants, found that customers thanked for their patience 
when their food was delayed, rated the restaurant more highly, tipped more, and were more likely to return compared to those who received an apology for the wait. As it turns out, saying thank you can actually lead to more loyalty and positive feedback. Now, why does this work? Well, it's all about focus. An apology shifts attention to the person who made the mistake, putting the burden on them. But gratitude shifts the focus to the customer, acknowledging their understanding and patience. It feels good to be appreciated, and it reinforces that sense of trust and respect. So how can we put this into practice in a gym setting? Here are a few scenarios where this thank you trick can work wonders. If you're running late, say, thank you for waiting, instead of, sorry, I'm late. If someone finds a mistake in your work, try, thank you for catching that, instead of apologizing for the oversight. Even when a member has to wait for equipment or space, a quick, thank you for your patience goes a long, long ways. Save the, I'm sorry, for those rare times when you genuinely need to apologize. So the next time you find yourself in a pinch, try showing some gratitude over apologizing. When it's sincere, when you're really looking your members in the eye and saying thank you, they'll feel it. And that genuine appreciation goes a long way in creating loyal, happy members. Just remember to actually use this in real situations and not in every situation, because then, like most things, it just loses its appeal. So use this tip and see the difference it makes. It's bound to leave your members with that warm, fuzzy feeling and turning them into true advocates for your gym. Thanks again for tuning into today's segment with me, Sumit Seth, the co-founder of Nomly. If you enjoyed this segment and are interested in getting more insights on elevating your member experience and setting your business up for success, then they click the link on the page for a free bundle of resources we've put together. All right, that's going to do for episode 390 of the Strength Coach Podcast. Don't forget the show notes are located at strengthcoachpodcast.com. You can try strengthcoach.com and mbsc.tv, both sites out. Seven-day free trial on both sides. You have to sign up separately. Go to strengthcoach.com and mbsc.tv. Special thanks to Chris Poirier and the folks over at Perform Better. Don't forget the Perform Better Signature Series is out. Changing the game. The, series, the Signature Series racks are fully customizable, allowing you to create the most efficient and effective rack system to fit your space. Also has cable column options now, so your training opportunities are practically endless. Check it all out at performbetter.com. Thanks to Coach Boyle for sharing his insights and philosophies into the world of strength conditioning and performance enhancement. Thanks to Sumit Seth and Namli helping build relationships through personalized communication so your members stay longer and pay longer. Check out the show notes for Namli's free fitness business boost bundle. Three gifts to you, a checklist, 51 ways to acquire clients without running ads, a cheat sheet, 12 places to look to hire star trainers and a guide nine secrets to increase your retention this week ali gilbert doing the silver back summit november 15th and 16th in phoenix i'll be there it's going to be awesome uh use the code ali g 200 it's not too late you can get 200 dollars off check it all out at silverbacksummit.com that's going to do it for this episode my name is anthony renner thanks for listening and i'll speak to you next time <music>